Hi, I'm Elise, an occupational therapist and certified stroke rehab specialist. And today, I'm gonna to answer your questions about neuroplasticity after stroke. Question one, what is neuroplasticity? Essentially, it is the brain's ability to adapt, reorganize, and make new connections. And this is different from neurogenesis, which is the idea that the brain can grow new nerve cells or new brain cells. We do have some limited evidence that this happens in small mammals, but we have little to no evidence that humans are capable of this. So currently, neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to reorganize or make new connections, is the best tool that we have for stroke recovery. Question two, why does the brain have heightened neuroplasticity after a stroke? In the first couple of days or so after the stroke happens, the brain is essentially just in scramble mode. It's trying to make sure that the basic functions are taken care of. Are you breathing? Are you able to regulate your temperature? Are you digesting your food? So even though there may be cognitive movement, speech limitations, it's just trying to say, okay, how can I recruit some secondary neural networks or brain networks to make those connections happen so all of those maintenance functions are taken care of? Then in the first couple of weeks, the brain is starting to reorganize and remake new connections. And this is when you might see that heightened neuroplasticity really start kick into gear. You can think of neuroplasticity sort of like being stuck at a traffic stop. Maybe they're doing construction on a back road or repairing a pipe that's causing a road shutdown. They have a detour set for you. So you're not getting to the same destination as quickly as you might have. You might have to take the scenic route around, but eventually you're going to get to that final destination. And neuroplasticity is kind of like that. It's basically the detour around the damaged areas of the brain to get you to the same destination. Question three. Does neuroplasticity have an expiration date? The short answer is no, but of course there is a longer answer. So what we do know is that neuroplasticity does slow as we age, but it doesn't stop. And the brain is capable of making those neuroplastic changes. And this is true after a neurological injury as well. When someone has a stroke, there is that heightened level of neuroplasticity in the first say three to six months up to a year after the stroke happens. And that is when you'll likely see the fastest amount of recovery happening. However, it doesn't mean that recovery and progress will stop after that time frame. It just means that it will likely slow down a bit. Question four, is neuroplasticity happening years after a stroke? Yes, it absolutely is. Now, like I mentioned, while the fastest amount of recovery and progress typically takes place in that first three, six months to a year after the stroke, that doesn't mean that neuroplasticity stops. Our brain is capable of making neuroplastic changes at any point in our lives. However, it does take work to make neuroplastic changes in our brain. We can't just expect to sit back and watch TV and for those neuroplastic changes to happen automatically. It takes consistency, intensity, and repetition. And you can think of this in the way, like if you were learning a new instrument. If you picked up a violin or you started plucking around on a piano for the first time, it's probably not gonna sound great unless you're just a prodigy. <laughs> However, if you put in intensity, if you repetitively practice, if you consistently practice, over time, you will see progress in your ability to make beautiful music. And it's the same way with stroke recovery. Putting in that effort, the consistency, the repetition, the intensity, over time, you will see progress, even if it is small changes over time. Question five, how can I use neuroplasticity to maximize recovery? This is a fantastic question. And I wanna start off first by saying that neuroplasticity actually has two aspects that are very important. There is a positive aspect, which is typically what I talk about because it's how we facilitate progress in rehab. But there is also a negative aspect to neuroplasticity that I wanna to touch on. And it's this maladaptive or negative neuroplasticity that can really get in the way of you being able to maximize recovery. 
And most often we see this in the form of learned non-use. And I've made a video about that in depth and I'll leave a link to that here and in the description. Essentially, learned non-use is when someone learns to not use their affected ability. So to give a quick example, let's say that someone has weakness of their affected arm. It is likely easier to do things with the unaffected side and it, you may start doing that after the stroke just because it's faster, it's easier, you may have somewhere to be and you wanna get those things done quickly like getting dressed, brushing your teeth, etc. You are telling the brain to prune away those pathways because the brain prioritizes pathways that are used the most often. So if that side becomes ignored, it's gonna say, okay, well, that's not really important. They're doing more things with this side. Uh, so let's forget about that side and just route everything that we need to do to the unaffected side. Now, if you're completely paralyzed, you have no movement, you know, there's a different story and there are other things that you can do for that, like mental practice, active visualization, and mirror therapy. I have videos on all of those, I'll link in the description. However, let's talk about the positive aspects of neuroplasticity. And this is where we get into the principles of neuroplasticity outlined in the 2008 article by Kleiman Jones. And that's kind of the gold standard that most rehab therapists go to, to um, frame our understanding about neuroplasticity. I made a video on that as well, so I'm not gonna go completely in depth, but I do wanna touch on a few of the principles. The first one is probably one that you have heard of most often, use it or lose it. And that one is pretty self-explanatory. The second is use it to improve it, meaning we have to use the abilities we have if we want to see progress. We also have to think about repetition and intensity. We have to do things with um, an intensity, so not just laying around watching TV and like half-heartedly doing something. And we have to do repetitions, repetitions, repetitions in order for our brain to remake those neural connections. We also have to do things that are salient to us. And by that, I mean that we need to be doing things that we find important and valuable. Question six, how many repetitions does it take for neuroplastic changes to happen? Well, we don't know an exact number, but what we do know is that it likely takes hundreds, if not thousands of repetitions for the brain to make any meaningful changes. And we can think about this in the instrument example again. Think about how long it takes someone to become an expert, to become proficient at that instrument. A long time. And you may have heard the saying, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert at something. Well, the same is true in stroke recovery. We have to put in that consistent, repetitive effort in order to see progress happen. And we're also learning the importance of a motor learning principle called mass practice, which is when you practice an exercise or an activity over and over and over again, repetitively with intensity in order to try and facilitate those neural, those brain changes. You can think of someone practicing a free throw over and over and over again to really build up that motor learning, to build up those pathways in the brain. So then it just becomes second nature. Question seven, what exercises should I do to promote neuroplastic changes and get control back? Well, basically you should be focusing on any exercises, movements, or activities that promote the movement that you're trying to regain. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're trying to get more um, shoulder flexion. You're trying to be able to raise your arm up. To do that, you wanna start by focusing on shoulder blade or uh, scapular exercises, as well as shoulder musculature exercises or activities. So you wanna kinda of work your way back. Think about the movement that you want. Think about the muscles that help those movements happen and then focus on exercises or activities that will allow you to practice that movement. Question eight, are there any supplements or medications that can help promote neuroplasticity? So as far as medications go, my recommendation would be to reach out to your doctor or your neurologist to ask about that. That is not my area of expertise. But when it comes to supplements, many of you are probably not gonna like this answer, but don't buy into the hype. There are so many things on the market um, that are not FDA approved. Most supplements aren't. Um, 
that companies will try to sell you when in actuality we have little to no studies and especially randomized control trials to say whether those supplements are safe or even effective. Likely at the end of the day, you're probably just gonna be wasting your money. If there's something that you're wanting to take, always talk to your doctor before starting something over the counter as it could potentially interfere with some of the medications that you're already taking. But there is some good news. If you are interested in improving cognition, improving um, brain health, there are several different dietary approaches that have been shown to reduce cognitive decline, and they include the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet, and the DASH diet. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail. I made a video about that a while ago. You can go check it out if you want more information. But those diets have been shown to promote cognitive brain health. It really centers around lots of fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, limited red meat and alcohol, limited added sugars and added salt, less processed food and more fresh foods. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Leave me a comment and let me know. If you were in therapy, did your therapist talk about neuroplasticity with you? If so, what was your biggest takeaway? And I will be leaving a link to all of the videos that I mentioned in the description below in case you wanna check any of those out in further detail. Of course, if you found this video helpful, please make sure to leave it a like. And if you're new here, hit the subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications for when I post new videos. Poststroke is a nonprofit and you can help us keep our content free either by clicking in the YouTube bar below and giving us a super thanks, by giving us a one-time donation via PayPal, or by becoming a Patreon member where in exchange for a monthly donation, you get access to cool perks like social media shout outs, behind the scenes footage, and even YouTube shout outs of which I have some today. And a special thank you to Heather G and our Empower tier. We can't do what we do without you all. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.